welcome to this lecture. This lecture is going to cover random effects. And for, to get our introduction to random effects, we're going to go all the way back to chapter 6, section 3, 4, and section 6. 3.4, not 3 and 4. Um, this is where random effects are introduced in the book. It gives a good overview. The key to understanding random effects is that the levels in random effects don't matter. That's because the levels come from a, are a subset of a much larger population. There's no desire for us to compare the effects of level one with level two because they're irrelevant. reason we're adding these random effects is because of that variation that they are causing. And it's that last statement that should show you how much these are different from fixed effects. Fixed effects the levels have specific fixed values, and we compare the effects of two different levels. For random effects, those levels are irrelevant. They come from a population, a much larger population. We don't care about comparing them, but we do realize that those random effects cause an increase in the variation of our y. So for instance, I'm going to start at the top. our usual one-way analysis of variance model. So far we've seen these tau's as being fixed effects where we care about understanding the difference between tau 1 and tau 2, tau 1 and tau 3, etc. If tau is a random effect, then this part is random variables. That's where the variation is. Without including the tau, if we take that tau out, there's the variation. And this epsilon is always the unexplained variation. And from a few lectures ago, we want to make sure that this gets as small as we can make it. Because that makes the test more powerful. So if we can break up or partition this unexplained variance into some explained variance, and then what's left over, we're actually making our test more powerful. So that's the reason why we include random effects at times. That worked. Um, here's a good setting for this. We want to explain student achievement. Well, according to this model, this is going to equal some average average in the entire population, this, this mu is the student-wide average achievement, however we're measuring achievement, plus the effect, well, if we want to compare the effect of one textbook with the other, then that would be a fixed effect, because we care about how these two textbooks compare. If we would like to compare the effect of one teaching method, teaching method X, epsilon, with teaching method delta, that would also be fixed effect because we want to compare how those two teaching methods affect 
student achievement in the population. If I want to just say this is the effect of teaching or of teachers, then that would be a random effect. Because I'm not actually comparing the effect of the teachers themselves, I just know that teachers affect the outcome. Since I'm not actually caring about the specific effect of teacher one versus teacher two, that's what makes this a random effect. Again, these things cause the variation. So we've broken up that big epsilon, the epsilon where we didn't include teachers, into two parts, something that's still unexplained, but something that we've measured and are able to explain, which means that this unexplained error goes down, which means that our NOVA test gets more powerful. I have said several times that we never compare, we really don't compare the levels of the tau. So we don't compare tau 1 with tau 2 if tau describes a random effect. But one hypothesis that we could care about is whether or not the variance of tau is 0. And we could also write this as the variance of tau is 0. How does the book do it? The book instead of uses variance of v. It does sigma squared sub tau to indicate that variance. And one reason we may want to test this is because if the variation of tau is zero, then this does a lousy job of reducing that unexplained variation because it explains none of the variation. To see the test that we would have to formulate, I'm going to do a little erasing, not too much. We go back to the expected mean squareds from a few lectures ago. And by the way, as an aside, this is the null hypothesis the alternative hypothesis is one-sided because it's squared. This seems rather obvious. Oh, this should be colons. This seems rather obvious, but as we move forward, the computer will sometimes estimate this variance to be negative, which raises some rather significant questions as to what that really means. So expected mean squared error, I'm sorry, expected mean squared for the between that's just the variance of that uh, epsilon, which we'll call sigma squared, plus that variance of tau. That's an n. Remember, n is the sample size within each of the groups. And the reason why we're multiplying by n is because this sigma squared tau affects the whole equation one time for every measurement within that group. And again, since there's no subscript on the n, we're assuming a balanced design. As always, expected mean squared error, the MSW. And again, I will, on the test, sometimes write MSE instead of MSW. That is just sigma squared, as always. And notice that if the null hypothesis is true, then n times sigma squared tau is equal to zero, and the expected mean squared between is equal to the expected mean squared within. So that tells us that our F statistic is going to be mean squared between divided by the mean squared within. 
And this will follow the typical F distribution, numerator degrees of freedom, denominator degrees of freedom, as you would expect. Some terminology. sigma squared and the n sigma squared tau are called variance component variance components and as statisticians if they if they exist in the estimate then we're going to want to estimate them eventually and you can figure out how to estimate them I mean the first step would be to estimate what the mean squared within is then to estimate what the mean squared between is. Now if you, if you subtract these two, you're just given an n sigma squared tau. We know n because the design is balanced, and that will allow us to solve for tau. Uh, I'm sorry, will allow us to solve for sigma squared tau. Do I have an example? I actually have an example. This is example 626 on page 299. Analysis of variance. I do. It's my notes say I need to read this and I need to emphasize something. So let me go ahead and read this and emphasize something. Two ninety nine. I need one more hand to help with this. Okay. So it's example six point. I'm sorry. It's example six point seven. It's table number six point two six. Suppose that a large school district was concerned about the differences in students' grades. So students' grades would be the Y, I, J. In one of the required top courses taught throughout the district. In particular, the district was concerned about the effect that teachers had on the variation. The school district was concerned about the effect that teachers had on the variation in students' grades. So we're not looking at trying to determine a ranking for the teachers. We're just saying, OK, I want to estimate the effect that teachers have on the variation. So that's key for we want to estimate what sigma squared tau is. So the table 6.26 gives us the raw data. The null hypotheses are given on page 299. Here's the ANOVA table. It would be good practice for you to be able to calculate these. I know we just had the midterm, and on the midterm you were you had to do this calculation by hand. It'd be good to get back into that habit. Uh, in this case, since there's four groups, uh, between, between degrees of freedom is going to be three. Total is 28. That's going to be n minus one. I'm sorry. Total is 27, which is n minus one. Three mi uh, 27 minus three is going to be degrees of freedom error. Sum of squared between is 683.3. Uh, sum of squares within, or sum of squared error, is 219.7. Write what I write, not what I say. I left off a one in there. 2803.0. And again, note that the degrees of freedom between plus degrees of freedom within equals degrees of freedom total. And the sum of squares between plus the sum of squares within is equal to the sum of squares total. That would be helpful. Mean squared, again, is always the sum of squares divided by the degrees of freedom. 
683.3 divided by 3 is 227.8. That is our estimate for the variance of mean squared between. Or our variance between, there we go. Uh, the sum of uh, mean squared within or the mean squared error is 2119.7 over 24. If I want the mean squared total, it would be 2803 divided by 27. Note that the mean squared total is not mean squared between plus mean squared within. But I don't care about that. And then the F statistic is just going to be the mean squared between divided by the mean squared within, 2.57. For what we're doing, that's irrelevant. We know from the expected mean squared within, sigma squared's estimate is going to be, I think I'm going to write it back here, 88.3. And from the expected mean squared between, this is just equal to sigma squared plus n sigma squared tau, and that's 683.3. I'm sorry, it's 227.8. The number's right there, and I still can't do it. There we go. And how did I get those? From the last page, the expected mean squared between, expected mean squared between is sigma squared plus n sigma squared tau. This is the estimate for the true mean squared between. This is the estimate for the sigma squared plus n sigma squared tau. And the expected mean squared error, or expected mean squared within, is just sigma squared. And this is our estimator. N in this case is, let's see, there's 28 altogether. There's four groups, so N must be 7. So I'm going to subtract these two, come up with 7 sigma squared tau. Because sigma squared plus N sigma squared tau minus sigma squared is 7 sigma squared tau. And then 227.8 minus 88.3. So 7 sigma squared tau is 139.5, which means that our estimate for sigma squared tau is going to be that 139.5 divided by 7 which is 19.9. What this number tells us, this is our estimate for the variance effect of teaching on student achievement. It's pretty small. Um, I can show you how to get a confidence interval here that's beyond the scope of this course in terms of doing it by hand. Um, your computer programs will be much better able to get a confidence interval. I will tell you that if a conf you do throw up a confidence interval on this sigma squared tau, it will include one. It will include one. Which means that the effect of teacher variation on student achievement is actually very low. What's another way that we knew it was actually very low? The F statistic was 2.57. That's less than the critical value for the F, which means we did not detect a difference amongst the, uh, we did not detect a null hypothesis, remember? Because the test statistic is less than the critical value we fail to reject the null hypothesis if there's no variation effect. Probably should have written down the p-value, but I'll leave that as an exercise for you. Use the data on table 622, I'm sorry, 626. 626. Generate this ANOVA table and then find out what the p-value is. And this p-value is going to be greater than alpha. 
since the p-value is greater than alpha, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. 